KO Linguistics, KO, uh, KO University and International Christian University uh, Linguistic Colloquium, uh, <clears throat> the first season one, day one. So this is the first day of the four day series that will happen in June uh, to uh, July 2020. I'm Sung Hun Lee from uh, I, uh, International Christian University and I teach linguistics here. Uh, this, <clears throat> before starting the meeting, uh, before starting the talk, I will have a few, uh, I have few announcements. First, uh, in the email uh, that you received, you will have a link uh, to a Google uh, Doc where you can actually uh, download the presentation slides. So if you're interested in uh, uh, getting those information, please use the Google Doc to download them. Uh, and then this meeting will be recorded. So if you do not want to show your face, uh, please turn off your video. Uh, so that's the next thing. The last thing is if you have a question during the talk, it's also okay to uh, raise it in advance and please uh, send a message to me, Sung Hun Lee. I will also uh, type the uh, type my name that you can find. Uh, so if you have any question, please send your name uh, and affiliation to Sung Hun Lee for question. So uh, today's uh, event will start with uh, Kane and Bryce, and then we will have a breakout session. And after that, we will have uh, Ryan Bennett's talk from 11 a.m. So uh, I hope, uh, thank you all again for being here. Uh, now I'm gonna give, you, uh, give the mic to Shigeto Kawahara at KU University, who will introduce Kane and Bryce. Hello. Oh, sorry. Hi, I'm Shigeto Kawahara from KU University and I'm very happy to introduce Kanan as the first speaker of this series. So Kanan is a fourth year graduate student at the linguistics department of UCLA. I first got to know Kanan when I first read one of, one of his papers that was uploaded on LingBuzz. And it is actually the paper that he's going to talk about today. And I was very impressed by like every aspect of the paper the way the project is framed in the current theoretical debates, the way the study is actually executed, the way it's statistically analyzed. And I got to know another paper of his on cumulativity, and with that, I couldn't resist getting in touch with him by email, and we started talking, and we even started a collaboration project. And throughout this process, I was impressed with statistical skills, and moreover, his ability to think about linguistic issues from a broader perspective, cognitive science. So not that I know very many grad students um, on the planet right now. He's probably one of the best grad students in linguistics right now. So that's why I invited him for this series. So without further ado, uh, let's hear from Kanan Bryce, who's talking about the effects of phonological factors on sentence formation. Kanan. Hi, um, Shigeto, and everyone else. Uh, thank you so much for that extremely generous introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I'm using a handout, but since we're all virtual, it should be basically the same thing as slides, I think. Um, so can everyone see the screen that I'm now sharing? Someone give me a thumbs up. Yes, okay, great. Mm -hmm. Awesome, okay, cool. Uh, great, well, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to um, speak here, I'm really excited. Uh, to be sharing this paper with you guys. Um, uh, I'll be talking, like Shigeto said, about uh, a project that I've been working on in collaboration with uh, Bruce Hayes, my advisor, and more recently, Tim Hunter at UCLA, um, looking at phonological effects in sentence formation. So, um, of course, the paper is available also if you want lots, lots more details on all of these things. So, um, the broad research question in this uh, project is, how do domains of linguistic knowledge interact in the creation of sentences? So one canonical answer to this um, question has been the classical feed-forward model um, proposed by Chomsky, where syntax feeds semantics and phonology. Uh, semantics then yields meaning, phonology feeds phonetics, phonetics yields sound. Um, and uh, one more thing, can you guys see my cursor here? If I could gesture with my cursor? Yes, yeah. okay, great. Thank you. Um, so 
a key prediction of this kind of feed forward model is that the construction of sentences, so whatever happens up in the syntax, is blind to the phonological consequences of word concatenation. Um, there have been oops, many challenges to the feed forward model. Um, we're going to focus on a particular kind today, um, one, one of which is speakers being able to choose from a variety of constructions it to um, when they make their sentences to avoid violating phonological uh, markedness constraints. So one example from Tagalog by a recent paper by Stephanie Shi and Kai Zara, um, shows that uh, Tagalog speakers use um, adjective noun orderings in a phonologically optimizing way, among other factors, such that they avoid uh, OCP nasal violations, hiatus, and other factors. Um, there's also a large other large body of work uh, like this that um, shows that people uh, kind of gradiently bias their sentence formation to avoid violating phonological markedness constraints. Um, another domain that's been studied in is choice among synonyms, so worse versus worser in the history of English. Um, worser died out because it was metrically, uh, kind of was on average metrically worse than worse. Um, but there are some very interesting studies by Shluta and uh, her colleagues about this. Um, so where this project fits in is instead of looking at very deep dive at one particular sentence construction um, or in a syntactic context, we're going to look at kind of an across the board approach. We're going to look at, we aim to look at whole sentences um, on all aspects of word concatenation. Um, so why do we do this? Uh, first off, we can look at a wider variety of phonological constraints, basically anything that can get violated at a word boundary. And by kind of taking a more uh, heterogeneous group of syntactic contexts, namely all of them, um, we hope to get a clearer sense of the mechanisms that underlie the patterns that are being observed. Um, so we're going to be using English because we have convenient access to native speakers and lots of written corpora, um, although in principle this approach is applicable to any language, um, and we hope that will be, will, will, be, will be applied to other languages in the future. Um, we're going to use uh, constraints. We're going to look for, for effective constraints that are um, powerful in that they're close to inviolable within words, and they have pretty good typological support. So um, the constraints we tested were clash. Um, this is avoiding adjacent stresses. I'm a clash, which is a special case of clash. Um, triple obstruent cluster and triple consonant cluster. These are kind of variations on star complex. Um, uh, further sibling clash. Um, so there is, this is exceptionally true within um, morphemes and uh, there are no words like mission. Um, similarly, geminates, there are no geminates in English and they tend to be repaired in high frequency, morphologically complex words like unknown. Um, uh, hiatus avoidance, uh, bad sonority, this is just the syllable contact law. Um, and we chose star in C, no voiceless consonants after nasals. It's not really that bad in English. We have lots of words like plant and count um, for diachronic reasons, but this has very good typological pedigree. So we thought we'd check it. So given our interest in investigating this wide range of phonological constraints, um, how are we gonna reduce the whole text to something that we can actually study in a rigorous, uh, I guess you can study a text in a whole text in a rigorous way, but that'd be very, very hard. So we're gonna shrink the problem down a little bit and look at word bigrams specifically. Um, so word bigrams are two consecutive words of a text. And so we can restate the research question by asking when English speakers form utterances, do they tend to create word bigrams that involve fewer violations of the phonological constraints above across the word boundary, kind of coda of one instead of the other, than, than what would be expected um, on general, general grounds. So if we take uh, Jane Austen's novel, uh, Emma, um, as an example of corpus, it begins, Emma Woodhouse, handsome, clever, and rich, with a comfortable home and happy disposition, seem to unite some of the best blessings of existence. Um, this is bigramified into Emma Woodhouse, Woodhouse handsome, handsome, clever, clever and, and about 160,000 more. Uh, so uh, we can then kind of re-restate our question. Um, if we imagine her heretically Jane Austen as just a device that emits word bigrams, um, we, the base uh, that emits words, um, she has uh, her mental lexicon, she has a whole lot of words she can choose from, and that we could have an coarse approximation of um, the baseline probability for any given bigram is just a product of the probability of word one and a product of the probability of, uh, with word two. Um, so we can restate the hypothesis as 
if Austin deviates from baseline probability for phonological reasons, um, then the word one, word two combinations uh, that violate phonological marketedness constraints should be less likely. Um, we're taking as our analytical method, um, now that we've stated our kind of goal in a specific sense, um, we're going to be using multinomial logistic regression, that is to say, maxent. Um, the, 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 yeah, the maxent occupies kind of interesting uh, place in this project because it's both a theoretical construct, it has a type of optimality theory, a type of harmonic grammar, um, and, but it's also used as a, a statistical model in this case. So a brief overview, um, maxent is a species of uh, OT. Um, within OT, it's a species of harmonic grammar, um, such that the constraints are uh, weighted rather than ranked. Um, and maxent is a stochastic theory. So it selects not a single winner, but a probability distribution over uh, possible outcomes. Um, further, and relevantly to our use of it, um, there are powerful accessible algorithms that reliably find the best weights to match the data that you feed it. Um, and interestingly, these same mechanisms, so a series of predictors, that's to say constraints, determining which of a number of outcomes, that's to say candidates, is chosen or you know, realized, um, has a long history in statistics. Kind of, it's been invented several times, it has a bunch of names, it's very useful, um, basically. And so uh, its broader guise is called multinomial logistic regression. Um, you can read more about it in Jurassic and Martin if you're interested, it's very cool. Uh, but kind of crucially for us, the idea of a grammar and the physical or the, the conceptual use of a statistical model are interchangeable. Um, so that might be something to keep in mind. So now let's apply the max end to the problem at hand. Um, let's uh, try and predict Jane Austen's bigrams with a large max end grammar. Um, so for this entire project, we're going to be comparing two different grammars um, whose pr purpose is to predict the frequency that she emits any given word bigram. So the simpler of these two grammars, uh, a baseline, will simply describe in phonological terms the population of word types that she uses. So kind of if she were sampling words from her lexicon at random, of course she's not, but if she were to do so, um, this would be a kind of baseline measure. And the other uh, more complex grammar uh, will also rely on the nine phonological constraints um, applied to these word bigrams. So we can then ask, do we do a better job of predicting the actually emitted bigrams if we include these phonological constraints? Um, if so, we can legitimately claim that these constraints have an influence on Austin's productions. Uh, there's several ways we could go about doing this. Um, one way is to have constraints that just regulate words directly, like have a constraint like use table, use apple, those kind of things. Um, but since Austin uses about 14,000 words in her writing, um, this method is not feasible. Uh, we are going to achieve the same kind of coverage, or at least the coverage of what we're, is relevant to us by aggregating the data. So we're specifying the individual words according to their phonological type. Um, these are types that are relevant to the phonological word bigram constraints we're testing in six. For example, in a word one, word two bigram, we can ask, does word one end in a vowel? Does word two begin in a vowel? Together, this is the only information we need to assess whether that bigram violates hiatus or not. Um, so we have constraints like this, um, phonological descriptions of word one and word two. Um, we're calling them constraints of convenience, um, and there are 53 of them. Um, we use something a little heretical, which is allowed them to take on negative weights, meaning it's good to violate them. Um, this is, I'm going to argue, fine, because we're not actually taking them as a serious model of what Jane Austen is doing. She's, in fact, creating art and not playing around with you know, constraints of convenience. Um, but they're a good way of statistically controlling for the baseline phonological properties of lexicon that she's using. Um, whoops. There we go. Um, so, once we have all of these things, uh, sorry, things keep on popping down. Um, we're going to set up, do kind of phonology as we know it. So we're going to kind of set up a candidate state, set uh, gen, um, and we're going to classify all the possible word bigrams um, according to which constraints of convenience they violate. So basically, we're going to take all of the possible word bigrams she could create and just ask how many distinct patterns of violations um, could there be. Uh, if we're interested in testing the nine constraints that we are. 
Um, it turns out there are only about 40,000 of these uh, candidates. So this is for us a feasible number. Um, so we're gonna continue making our tableau. We have uh, about 38,000 candidates um, and we have columns of constraints. Whoops, uh, looks like Microsoft Word had an error here. Um, reference not found, my apologies. Uh, in any case, there are two kinds of constraints. Um, in two different models. So the simpler model, like I talked about before, the baseline model is just the 53 constraints of convenience before. Um, this is kind of trying to give a baseline control for the phonological properties of the lexicon that Austin is using to make bigrams. Um, there's a, another model, the testing model, um, that is a superset of this model. It's the 53 plus the nine phonological constraints that regulate both word one and word two in the bigram um, that we're interested in studying. This we're going to call the, the testing mode. And then, of course, we plug in, well, how many of each of the 38,016 uh, biograms were there actually in a given corpus? Um, so what we actually did is we picked a text. Um, we'll talk about which text we picked in a little bit. We reduced it to its biograms, um, assessed the violation of our 53 constraints of convenience plus nine phonological constraints for each biogram, made a big tableau, um, and then used uh, software created by Tim Hunter um, to find the best weights for the constraints. This software is nothing mysterious. It's just um, a hill climbing algorithm that works better than Excel in this case, um, just because it's our, our data is big. Um, and we do this twice. First, in the baseline mode for the 53 constraints of convenience, and then the testing mode, where we add in the phonological constraints. We can then expect that if word concatenation respects phonological markedness, then the weights of the phonological word bigram constraints should be positive. That is to say, they should penalize violations. And further, crucially, a grammar that includes these nine constraints should be more accurate in predicting the data than one without it. Um, we also do a statistical test, a likelihood ratio test, to um, uh, assess the probability that the improvements in predictions were kind of meaningfully different from chance. So moving on, uh, we analyzed 14 corpora. Um, just for the sake of uh, transparency, we had five corpora when we were developing this method. And then once we fixed our analytic method, we pulled the remaining nine. Um, so, and the results looked the same across both of them. So we haven't overfit ourselves, I hope, I think. Um, eight were written corpora and six were spoken corpora. Um, and we, pre-edited the corpora in various ways. That is to say, we, rather than necessarily taking all of the biograms we could have taken um, that were in the corpus, we kind of select a few at a time. Um, and we can do this so as to be able to diagnose the mechanisms by which markedness is playing a role in sentence formation. So what I'm gonna show you first as the main result is the core mode of analysis. This is taking all of the biograms, um, uh, Emma Woodhouse, Woodhouse Handsome, Handsome, Clever, Clever, and, and Rich, as we saw before, um, and excluding biograms that include a grammatical function word that occur more than once in the sample or that are separated by a major phonological break, assuming the presence of a punctuation mark correlates with a big phonological break. Um, this is the most stringent results. Uh, we're trying our best to control for as much as we can. Frequency, the syntax, um, listness, that kind of thing. Um, and these are the results. So let me walk you through this graph a little bit. Um, the vertical axis is the weight of the phonological markedness constraints. Um, the little dots are the 14 corpora that we tested them in, and the black line is the average. So, and of course, across the x-axis uh, are the constraint names that were tested. So you can see that uh, in you know, the iambic clash, the average weight was something like 2.4 or something, um, or sorry, 0.24. And each can, corpus kind of varied a little bit around it. Um, to what I, we can kind of read generally off of this is that the weights are positive for all corpora. Um, and taken as a group, the constraints are statistically significant. Um, the, the sort of fun you might note is clash. Why is it good to violate clash here? Um, we have an interesting thought about this. Uh, and we think we can explain why this is negative in this mode which actually leads into some of the markedness um, mechanisms that are be at work here. So tentatively, the answer to our question is yes, the phonological constraints are influencing the population of biograms emitted by writers and speakers, at least in these 14 corpora. 
Um, so let's try and find uh, the cause for these marketless effects. Um, we think that more than one mechanism is responsible. And further, we hope to show that by varying the conditions on the maxent modeling, we can find evidence that kind of points towards different causes being responsible for different parts. Um, one, our, one of our first kind of causal mechanism is that uh, we think that listed phrases are phonologically optimized. So there's a large liter literature, both in kind of psychology proper and also psycholinguistics, that um, the vocabulary of listed phrases in a language is huge. Basically, everything is listed more or less. Um, uh, they're just examples of very frequent bigrams from Austin are very well, great deal, good man, very good, few minutes, that kind of thing. And so uh, I hope to, I hope you share my intuition that these are very familiar phrases and thus um, if something is going to be listed for efficiencies purposes, purposes these would be listed. Um, we, this uh, earlier work has shown that uh, looking at, uh, yeah, Phonological marking effects um, are listed are, are at work in listed phrases. Um, so Martin found uh, that compounds avoid creating uh, marked kind of compound pairs in the same sense that we found with word bigrams. So his interpretation is that candidate compounds are created online, <coughs> get incorporated into the lexicon preferentially if they're phonologically unmarked. That is to say, the lexicon of listed compounds accretes well-formed members over time, and then because established compounds are used frequency, frequently, um, the observed corpus of compounds will tend to be phonologically unmarked. Um, and you provide some pretty compelling evidence, I think, that this is uh, the true story here. And this um, explanation extends very straightforwardly to the bigrams and listed phrases we we're looking at here. Um, other work with similar conclusions out of psycholinguistics uh, can be viewed here. Um, we think that uh, this, this um, listed phrases may play a role in our own findings. Um, and we check this by looking at um, super habaxes. That is to say, <coughs> excuse me, um, in the core mode, we reduce the data to nothing but habax bigrams. That is to say, that only those bigrams that occurred once in the entire corpus. And suppose instead that we look at the reverse, only those that are more frequent than one, and so they're more likely to be listed. If the hypothesis that listed things are phonologically optimized, we should find that this set of bigrams um, are generally have higher weights than the core mode. Um, we find this is generally the case. Um, the core here is the dotted line. <laughs> Excuse me. And um, the super hapax are condition weights of the same uh, type are the black line. So, we think that preferential left listing as applies mostly to phrases is a major factor in why it looks like phonological markedness uh, constraints are respected in sentence formation. Um, we have a second conjectured mechanism, uh, syntactic choices. Um, particularly, syntactic instructions employ function words generally. Um, so uh, generative choice in English, the wheel of the car versus the car's wheel. There's the choice of a dative. There is she and Zora's Tagalog case. Um, that kind of the, the placement of function words is strongly regulated by syntactic factors. Obviously, ask any syntactician, they'll agree with you, hopefully. Um, and so we think that speakers kind of, we suggested above that speakers deploy these constructions kind of uh, in a phonological optimizing way. So we can check this uh, by taking, uh, by creating a function mode of bigram analysis. So this is like the core mode, but half axis only. Um, and we avoid bigrams across phrasal breaks. But this time we're including bigrams that have function words. So the wheel, wheel of, of the, the car, those would all have been excluded before, but now they're not. Um, under the hypothesis that, uh, that speakers deploy function words in a, such a way that is phonologically optimizing, we should now expect that this population of bigrams <coughs> is more well formed than the baseline. Um, and we again see this is true. The dotted line is the function mode, excuse me, the dotted line is the core mode, and the solid line is the function mode. 
So we can then fold all these factors together and just take, well, why don't we just include all of the bigrams that are phrase internal um, and also add in um, tokens rather than type frequency. This is what we call simple mode and this is in 32. Um, so clearly this is the strongest outcome since we're combining the effects of including super hapexes with function words. Um, an additional comparison or not reported here showed us that token frequency is also giving things an additional boost. Let's skip this just for the sake of time. Um, so great, we've seen lots of very low constraint weights. They're all positive, but they, what does this mean for uh, people who are making sentences? That is to say all of us. Um, consider the following, two candidates, the constraint weights can be interpreted in the following way. Two candidates that are identical, except the one violates constraint with weight W and the other doesn't. Um, they receive a probability ratio such that the non-violator is um, a certain amount um, more likely to be output by the grammar. So for intuition's sake, we're gonna redo this chart, chart by, <coughs> excuse me, transforming the, uh, applying this transformation to all of the weights here and then plot the um, probability of occurrence. So we can read this chart as in the following way. Um, a bigram violating clash is only 60% as likely to be emitted as a bigram that is otherwise identical but does not violate clash. Um, a bigram violating iambic clash is only about 30% as likely. Um, so there's a 70% reduction for this. Um, of course, other effects are smaller, but I think this is, at least for me, a much more intuitive way of visualizing that like, this is a pretty strong effect, relatively speaking. So much time I have. Two minutes, okay. So, um, we're gonna kind of show one more comparison here. Um, this is comparing all of the modes in one place. Um, this is the average constraint weight for each mode. So now we're averaging over all of the dots, over all of the constraints. So this is that pretty coarse grain measure, but it kind of allows a rough comparison of how strong the effect is in each mode. Um, you'll notice that there are three modes here that I didn't talk about. Um, I'm happy to discuss these. These are kind of sanity checks um, to make sure the effect is working. Like for example, when we scramble the corpus before we divide it into bigrams, does the effect go away? The answer is yes, um, fortunately, and these are similar. Um, the, that details are in the appendix if you're curious. Um, but as you can see, the average constraint weight in core, the most stringent condition, is fairly low, but still significantly above zero. And then as we add in these other factors, that is to say listedness, um, syntactic optimization online, and then kind of all of these factors together, plus the effect of uh, word frequency itself, um, then you get much stronger effects. Uh, yeah, let's just skip to general discussion because I said that. So um, to summarize what we've talked about here, uh, earlier work on phonological effects uh, in sentence formation detected uh, these kind of effects in specific syntactic contexts and dealing with specific lexical items. Um, we proposed a scaled up across the board approach that implemented in a robust framework um, that reinforces the view we think that these effects are pervasive. Um, found for lots of different phonological constraints and lots of different syntactic contexts. Um, our different modes of analysis also illuminate the role of two factors in producing the observed effects. Let's say uh, preferential listing of phonologically unmarked phrases um, and syntactic choices that are kind of deployed online by the speaker in a phonologically optimizing way. So uh, what does this mean for the diagram we saw above, the Y model, the feed forward model? Um, well, let's first suppose what are the, what is the what is the organization of the grammar that's compatible with our findings? Um, let's first uh, take, some, take the idea that something like OT is correct for all grammatical components. So grammar is embodied by a number of interacting types of constraints, um, semantic constraints, syntactic constraints, morphological constraints, phonetic constraints, um, and uh, the complexity uh, in language arises via the prioritized and kind of competing application of many different uh, kind of drives from different parts of the language system. Um, further, let us be probabilistic about this because Langdon is probabilistic and assume that something like the max end out version of OT is correct. Um, so this means that any constraint whatsoever, including uh, weak ones like phonological markedness constraints can perturb output frequencies. Um, so in this 
we kind of are proposing a Maxent implemented version um, of a pure parallel architecture. Um, so in this sense, meaning um, feeds, uh, sorry, so your meaning goes in here. Uh, there's a whole bunch of ways of realizing this. Um, that's say different words you could have chosen, different sentence structures you could have made. Um, and you choose among them subject, of course, to faithfulness to what you meant to say. Um, and, but also according to, you know, subtle phonological effects. And this is then produced uh, as sound. Um, so in this case, candidates are highly structured objects. There was a lot of information in each candidate, much more than just in regular phon phonology. Um, and eval signs some probability um, to every candidate. Um, like I said, faithful constraints uh, encourage us to choose an output that is basically what we wanted to say. And uh, this is not really a new idea to us. Um, this is just a kind of accent formalization of a parallelist architecture that has also been proposed by Jackendorf and Bresnan and others. Um, so where to go next? Uh, so we've argued that we've, we've used Maxent here in its guise as a method, method of statistical evaluation. Um, but in the future, we really want to start doing full-scale grammars of the grammar, Maxent grammars, uh, modeling on uh, using this architecture above, this parallel architecture. Um, so working with such grammars can give us greater confidence the result we obtained here are correct. That is to say, by modeling actual syntax rather than just bigrams. Um, we, of course, do not believe that the language uh, user themselves is using bigrams in their head. This is just a way of us trying to get, a, get, get to grips with a very complicated system. Um, and also, we think this is kind of the grammar is the way to go for the future because it's large scale, it's computationally implemented, um, it will avoid us. Uh, sorry, it will help us to avoid uh, kind of myopia and anecdotalism with respect to our data, and also of, uh, allow us to seriously evaluate all theoretical proposals, not just kind of the ones that can be boiled down into a certain phonological implementation. Um, we're currently working um, on a small step towards this uh, goal. Um, we're collaborating with Tim Hunter, me and uh, Bruce, um, to develop a phonologically aware syntactic parser. Um, this is based on the, on the probabilistic left corner grammar formalism. Um, and the model is basically able to act as a tighter control for syntactic factors with influence sentence formation um, because it models syntax, thank goodness. Um, and uh, we've been working with the Penn Tree Bank and a subset of the Childless Corpus, and the effects hold up so far. So um, hopefully, I don't know, in another uh, six months, I'll have um, further work to show you guys about that. Um, thanks very much. Uh, I think maybe I can take questions or however people want to do that. Yeah. So <clears throat> if you have any question, uh, please uh, send uh, your name uh, and affiliation to me uh, with a private chat. Uh, so my name is Sun Hun Lee, so please send it to me. Uh, first question comes from Yuna Yi from Seoul National University. Please go ahead. Can you unmute you? I can't hear anyone. Yeah. Let me just. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Yuna from, Yuna E from Seoul National University, and my question was, um, I, first of all, I enjoyed your talk very much, um, and my question was, um, do you think this tendency to violate less syntactic constraints when building sentence, sentences would be stronger when um, speakers actually produce speech than um, in, in the writing, such as Austin's um, text? And do you have uh, a plan to like work on that? So we actually, uh, this isn't a diagram that I have right here, but in the paper we go into some discussion on this topic. Um, so we actually find the opposite. So if I understand what you said correctly, you suggested that uh, speakers who are speaking uh, spontaneously would show more observance of the phonological uh, factors. We found that the spoken corpora actually show a weaker effects. So we oh, really? hypothesize that this is, yeah, um, that this is basically the result of people having the time to edit their work. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure I, I certainly speak with all sorts of disfluencies and phonological uh, 
grossnesses that I would edit out if I could re-edit myself. Um, and so we think this is what's at play here. Um, the effects still hold in spoken uh, speech. Um, mm -hmm. And it also seems to be kind of genre dependent. So with between author, there's quite a bit of variation. And also um, between, for example, the Wall Street Journal corpus, which is financial text, and uh, the childless corpus, which is like um, parent-child interaction, um, the effect in the childless corpus is much larger, presumably because it's much more casual speech. Thank you. That's very mm -hmm. interesting. Thanks. Yep. Next is uh, uh, Noriko Kurosaki from Meiji University. Would it help if I stopped screen sharing? Or is this helpful for people? Uh, it might be uh, nice to share the screen so you can refer to uh, the points where they asked the question. OK. I can't hear the um, person. Uh, yes. Wait. Uh, I'm looking for the person uh, on the list. Noriko, uh, just a second, I'm sorry about this. Maybe the person is not here right now. Uh, uh, so we'll move to the next question in the meantime. Uh, Ryan Bennett from UC Santa Cruz. Again, uh, interesting stuff. Um, my question was just, what do you make of the fact that um, a couple of the constraints that seem to be pretty good predictors here, so star and C and uh, hiatus avoidance are actually pretty rampantly avoided in the, uh, or those configurations are widely attested in the lexicon of English, and yet they seem to be decent predictors of vibrant choice. So. I think, um, that's a, that's a good question. The relationship between word internal phonotactics and kind of spillover effects into phrasal phonology is maybe kind of underlying what you're getting at and is not entirely straightforward. It's like, I, I, in looking at other languages, it's a pretty good rule of thumb, like for example, vowel harmony languages, that uh, languages with vowel harmony word internally will respect that uh, across words gradiently. Um, the, it looks like in, in the end, star and C specifically doesn't really do that much in English. Like it's a very small effect, but uh, that's not entirely surprising to me because it really doesn't do much within the word internal phonotactics. Um, hiatus, uh, I, would, I would conjecture these are just kind of generally gradient phonotactics. So um, we would assume that things that are categorical, like geminates or sibling clash or that kind of thing, would be. Uh, stronger between words, but just because there are exceptions to it doesn't mean that they're not uh, well avoided when possible. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think it answers a lot of it. I mean, in a, in a, in a sense, my question is also about comparing these constraints, which are not particularly well supported by the lexicon of English, to um, the, the model that you didn't talk a lot about, where you just came up with you know, random bag constraints that are not mm -hmm. justified mm -hmm. by English or by the typology, and, which, and the appendix didn't seem to really play out um, predictively, and yet hiatus actually in some of the models is, is quite effective at predicting bigram choice. So it's, I think it's partially the size of the effect of hiatus in some of the models relative to its efficacy for word internal phonology that I, I thought was sort of striking um, against that backdrop. Yeah, I think, I mean, I've been looking at word internal hiatus in English for unrelated reasons recently, and it's strikingly restricted. So like you do have hiatus word internally, but it's really only when you could kind of form a form a glide to get yourself out of the sticky situation. Um, so things like um, the drama about adjacent schwas are really that's not that's categorically banned within words. And those and those kind of bigrams are included in this set that we're assessing. Thanks. Okay. Next uh, is John Kingston from UMass Amherst. Um, hey, hi. Um, my video has been stopped. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, the question is quite simple. If you gave people a choice between a conforming and a non-conforming bigram, do you think they would actually choose the one that conformed? Let's treat this as, as a composition task, on, essentially an online composition task. 
Uh, can I can I ask you to? Do you mean like if we were to run an experiment and give people exactly. either ask them to rate bigrams or compose words in a particular way? Um, well, I, yeah, I had in mind a very simple uh, binary choice: give them a string which conforms and a let's call it a synonymous string which fails. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that they um, would choose the conforming form more often than the non-conforming form? Um, I actually ran a small experiment as part of my master's that looked at this. Um, for some constraints, yes. I think I would want to go back and do it with better research methods, frankly, mm -hmm. um, to really stand behind that result. But I think that is what you would predict. And mm -hmm. what I've found is not entirely inconsistent with that. I see. Although um, people haven't looked at it directly. Sorry, go ahead. No, that's fine. Um, if you want to elaborate on the way it was inconsistent, I'd be like, I'd like to hear it. So. Um, okay, we have one more question uh, uh, by Hiromu Sakai. After this question, we are going to open the breakup room for anybody who wants to continue the uh, discussion with Kena. First, uh, Hiromu Sakai Sensei from Waseda University. Uh, it's a very, very nice talk, and uh, thank you very much. So my question is about the uh, two points in your summary. And the, you mentioned that there, are, uh, there might be two possible factors uh, from this uh, effect. And the one is preferential lexical listing, and the, the other is syntactic choice made online. And the, mm -hmm. I think they are very different uh, things. And the, um, in some model, uh, you might want to uh, locate these two things in a different place, probably. Uh, for instance, the first one might be a constraint on the lexicon or memory, and the, the other one will be something like a derivation or a production constraint. And the, uh, do you have any comments or elaboration on uh, treating these two things differently? or? Uh, yeah, thanks for your question. I think that's a very good point to draw out because I list these as though they could have come from the same uh, place. But really, this is, like you said, quite distinct. This preferential listing of phonologically unmarked items is really a diachronic effect or a diachronic synchronic feedback loop. So the way people kind of, when they have learned their language fully, um, their lexicon is such that the things that are higher frequency uh -huh. and thus more likely to be less listed or more strongly encoded, if you want to talk about uh, psycholinguistics, um, are things that are likely to be phonologically more unmarked. And uh -huh. so then they go through their life and they kind of, in their daily life when they're using their language, um, their syntactic, whatever they're doing with their syntax, the derivation or the constraints or however that's cached out, is kind of subtly biased by the synchronic phonological grammar. So you're totally right to point out that these are two effects that yield the kind of uh, synergistically create the findings that we have here, but only one of them is directly on online, so to speak, in the syntax, and the other is uh, we're arguing kind of a uh, an eventual result of having a phonology, but not directly. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, yes. And uh, do you have? Do you think? that the, uh, the difference between the uh, written corpus and the spoken corpus might be also be affected in the, uh, this, these differences. So my uh, very naive idea is written corpus are uh, uh, often uh, written a lot of time, uh, they're written a lot of times and the over uh, uh, people will think over the written text uh, mm -hmm. times, but the spoken corpus are uh, uh, spoken in uh, just once. So, uh, mm -hmm. so I think, I, I think you're, you're you're right also about that. Like we think that the distinction that between the written and spoken corpus both are like the effect remains in both, but it is stronger in the written corpus. Mm -hmm. We think that this is basically the time, the effect of the time people have to kind of ponder their words, maybe to choose a more elegant phrase, whatever the authorial intent is there. And we argue that some small portion of what people think of as the right way to phrase something is phonological. Certainly not the whole thing, but since their written text is given more of that attention, um, 
it's more likely to be exaggerated in the written text rather than uh, the spoken text. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kainan, and thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much also. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah. So uh, from now, uh, uh, we will have the breakout room and the option is being made, I, I suppose. Uh, uh, yes, I think uh, everybody is uh, uh, invited. Of course, you don't need to go to the breakout room. Canon will be in the breakout, breakout room uh, from now on. Uh, so if you want to continue any informal discussion with Canon, uh, please join the breakout room. You can ask a uh, further question. The breakout rooms will not be recorded. Yeah. So thank you again, and we will meet at 11 a.m. Uh, uh, for uh, around 10:58 for Ryan Bennett's talk. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>